Welcome to the Indie Music Room, a conversation with independent artists about writing, recording, performing, and promoting their original music. And now here's your host, Heather Kelly. Hey everybody, welcome to the Indie Music Room. You're listening to Heather Kelly, and I'm excited to introduce our Artist of the Month for April. I can't believe it's April already, but here we are. I want to introduce Brian Dudley from Ames, Iowa. Hi, Brian. How are you doing today? Great. How are you doing, Heather? Fantastic. Fantastic. I just want you to let everybody kind of know about um, how you got into music and and when it started for you, and and we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, I was a bit of a late bloomer. I I didn't. My I wanted to play music when I was a kid. Um, I you know I got interviewed. You know they did little band interviews and stuff when you're like fifth grade and everything. Um, and I wanted to do it. And my my parents told me it was a scam, <laughs> <laughs> which I, which I thought was very weird. That's funniest uh, thing I've ever. Heard. <laughs> yeah. And, and, okay. You know, and, you know, and I'm a kid, so I believe them. I'm sort of like, oh, okay, I won't do that then. Uh, um, and then in, in high school, I, I started getting into rock and roll a little bit and, you know, and expressed a little bit of interest in doing it, um, you know, uh, not nothing too big or anything. Um, but then uh, I got really into um, uh, Pink Floyd. Uh, and, and and I heard the the guitar solo from Comfortably Numb in particular, um, right. and, and that that second one where he really goes up the neck and he's screaming, and I'm sort of like, how are those sounds made? And for some reason, it was the first time I really needed to know how the sounds were made. Um, and so, and I had just gone to college. I just, I was 18, came back to visit my mom and my mom was a big garage sailor. So we went to a garage sale and uh, I saw just this really shitty guitar and amp for like $10. Ooh, and, what a find. I know. And I begged my mom to, to buy it for me. And she lent, she lent me the money, let me the $10 to get it. Um, and, and so I started trying to play and I, I was terrible. I was not any kind of natural at it at all. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the beginning of it. It was mostly wanting to know how David Gilmour made those sounds. Um, and then finally getting that guitar. Um, and then when I, when I was at college, I was in the dorms and my roommate ended up being a music major. And so here I am stumbling around on my guitar and stuff. And he showed me like bar chords and some very basic stuff. And he was, you know, he was much better than I was. And I was, I was yeah. really lucky that that was a pivotal point for me because, um, if I hadn't had somebody show me, no, no, it's easier than you think. Um, <laughs> you know, he made it look so easy that it kept me going right do you have a tendency to play by ear so if you hear a song you can kind of find the chords and and play along with it or is it more structured than that yeah uh yeah i took a a few lessons uh like uh when i was at college right right after i got the guitar um i I sought out lessons through i went to i went to college uh iowa central community college in fort dodge um (laughs) And uh, they have a music program there, and my roommate was a music major. So I, I, I went and talked to the music department with his help, and, uh, and they set me up with a guitar teacher. Um, and I had a couple of them. The first one was Brooke Hoover, um, who, who is now like, you know, he's in the surf zombies. He lives in Cedar Rapids and stuff. But at the time he was at home, uh, you know, living with his parents, I'm, I think, you know, and his dad. He's been was, a uh, previous guest of mine. So he's been on the show before. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He was my first guitar teacher. Uh, yep. So I went to him for a while. And then I think like, uh, and then after a little while, they switched guitar teachers or something. And, uh, and I ended up with a guy who taught jazz. And that guy made me feel like I was like really, really terrible. Terrible. Like he'd send me home with things oh. and, I, and I worked really, really hard. Cause at the time I thought, you know, I learned a few blue scales and I was feeling like kind of hot stuff, you know? And, uh, right. uh, and then they hooked me up with this jazz guy who was like, you know, whatever. Uh, but at the end of the semester, you know, I told, I was like, man, I, I was like, you know, do I need to drop this class? Am I failing? Because I, you know, you would give me like five songs to learn and I'd come back having learned only two of them because they were in such knuckle buster, you know? And so he was like, Oh, all my other students dropped out halfway through the semester. You're the only one. You're my best student. Well, hey, way to hang in there. <laughs> yeah, but but I, I had no idea that was going on. The whole time I was like busting ass and like, you know, thinking that I was sucking. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, obviously you've got uh, quite a quite experience behind you now, but tell me how, what other bands have you been in besides Strong Lake Bear? Because I feel like when we met about 16 yeah. years ago, it might have been another band. It was another band. It, okay. was, uh, it was called Otter. Otter, that's correct. Well, yeah. So you went from Otter and then did you start Strong Lake Bear or was it something you joined to be part of? Um, kind of both. It was a, a Strong Lake Bear was uh, like an acoustic band that my friend Jordan and I started. Uh, and she was just a really good friend of mine. And we were we 
you know, she, I met her when she was like really young and, and uh, my wife and I had just moved back from Germany and she was just starting to play music when she was like 16. And we were like, you know, 10 years older than her and yeah. we started farting around and she had all these beautiful songs, but she, you know, um, she, she, I don't think she had enough like self-confidence maybe to push herself. And so right. I started playing with her and, uh, and our styles meshed really well. And so we said, and at one point we decided we'll call ourselves strong like bear and we, we play coffee shops and Otter was the rock band. And so we were playing like clubs and doing that. Um, and then Otter ended up breaking up. Um, but we kept the bass player from Otter. Um, and my wife was in both bands. So, oh, really? Um, yeah. And, and so like we, we kept the bass player from Otter. And then we, and we went from being acoustic to like adding electric stuff. And then Strong Like Bear became sort of like smooshed together between the two things. Sure. Um, yeah. Our first EP was like very mellow, melodic, like pop songs you know with folk influence and stuff and then you know and then over time we do, we've changed oh you know done a lot of stuff and our most recent stuff is like stoner rock now so and we've had like you know experimented with ever, like lots of different things in between but yeah i started otter was the band that we were we came up to uh juniors motel and we recorded there and which is where we met um and that was a very good time that was a we had a blast doing that and uh um and that was a fun band you know and i learned a lot from that band right um, yeah, I've been in bands uh, since um, I, don't know, I was in a couple bands here in Ames. Not, they didn't really go anywhere. Um, I was in a band called Mother's Other Lover. Along that was the first band I was in. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, where do you uh, get these bands? <laughs> uh, that one came from like a misunderstanding. Uh, my, my my wife was talking about how she had a roommate named Myrtle, and she was and she saw a story about how Myrtle had a uh, like a number of boyfriends, and so she said, uh, so Myrtle's lover came over, and then Myrtle's other lover, and my and my friend Miss Herda said, "Mother's other lover, what?" And, and then we, we cracked up so much. We're like, "That's got to be a band name." Man. <laughs> oh my god! So, what does your wife play in the band? She's the drummer, and she, she's a drummer. That's she's badass. A drummer. Okay. Yeah, she, she's pretty badass. She's a okay. drummer and she sings a lot of like harmony vocals and things like that. She's a great singer too. She's uh, her vocals are kind of the secret weapon, I think, in, in the bands that we're in. They, they make us sound like way bigger and more like our shits together. So, right. Um, yeah. And she's a great drummer too. So, you know, I, and I, you know what I noticed, we'll bring it up on the third song, but I noticed some beautiful harmonies. So I'm like, I'm going to ask where those came from, but uh, you kind of gave me an idea where, but we'll talk about that on the third, third song. Okay. Okay. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about your writing process when you write a song? Do you write it to music or do you write the words first or how do you do it? Do you play piano at all or just guitar? Uh, mostly guitar. Um, I I can think around on keys a little bit, but I'm not a keyboard player. I've, I've done like some, you know, session, like, you know, like sit down and figure out what I'm going to play on the keys and add it to something. And then as soon as I record it, it's gone, you know, I, I, but I would, I've never written anything on keys. I'd, I'd like to, I just yeah. have never sat down and done it. Um, I'm, I usually, I mean, most of my process is I fart around on guitar until I come up with something interesting and then, uh, um, and then I go, Hey, wait, that, there's something there. That's a song. And then I'll start writing lyrics to that. Um, that's generally my process. I'm really, I've, I've had a couple songs where the lyrics came first, but that's very, I don't know, infrequent. And, and I hear that like, you know, like a lot of, uh, my favorite songwriting heroes, uh, do it that way. They write the lyrics first and then come up with the music. And that is like, my brain doesn't comprehend that. That's just like completely backwards for me. So. Right. Um, I tend to agree like with you on. when I write, I, I tend to play, like I, I write on piano, obviously, but I tend to write on the piano and then add the words and Kirk's like, mm -hmm. try it the other way. Just, you know, try to accommodate your vocals versus finding something to accommodate your piano part. So I've been trying to switch it up and do it the other way, but it's difficult once you're kind of used to one way. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I think it's probably old dog, new tricks for me there. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The first song we're going to play today, Brian, is Days Gone Sour. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what that's about, how you recorded it, and we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. Um, Days Gone Sour, I mean, the, the guitar riff came first, uh, and I just really liked the riff. I felt like it was an unusual sort of riff, um, just from, for the way that I play, which, you know, you know, we're always trying to break out of our boxes and do something new. And so I felt like, hey, I've never done one like this before. This is cool. Right. Um, and and the, the lyrics are basically how, uh, you know, the in the chorus, the main line is we've got to burn these days gone sour because it's sort of like, 
man, you just get, you know, and, and this song was written a while ago, not before, like, you know, you know, we can argue about like whatever the last six, seven years or whatever, where things seem like they've gone on, you know, like crazy stuff, but like right. the song was written before all that stuff. And, and, you know, it was just sort of like, you know, it felt like there were some bad events and things like that. And, and I kind of got tired of all the bad stuff. And I was like, we gotta get past this, you know, let's take these, you know, it felt like everything's gone sour. So let's just get rid of it. It kind of um, sums up what's going on these days in our world. So this song probably stands the test of time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Things are always going to have at least a bad element every year or something. And so we got to make the most of it and, you know, find our joy where we can. Um, and one other thing, uh, we recorded that song and the bulk of that album uh, with Phil Young uh, down in Des Moines. Um, and Phil Young is like, a, he's a pretty acclaimed producer at this point. He's done like lots and lots of stuff. Um, at the time when we started recording that, uh, he, we recorded it in his, uh, his uh, apartment. Uh, we started out recording the album there and then he moved to another studio. Um, and this was the song that we, we, we knew it had a jam in the middle of it. And so there was no way for us to piece it together. We had, we were going to have to play the whole song live. Um, and so we went to his new studio and, uh, and it was like this really cool room, you know, he had this control room and stuff. Uh, um, I'm trying to remember the name, the guy that owns the studio, it's called the establishment. And, and he, he has a, I mean, he's in a band that like, you know, tours nationally and stuff like that. Okay. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now. Uh, like a case tree or I, I don't know. I'm going to massacre it. Never mind. Yeah. That story. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like, uh, so we went in and we did only worked only on that song that day. Um, the rest of this, the rest of the album we did, we would do most of the songs in one day, like get all the drums and bass and stuff done. And then I would go back and overdub guitars and everything. But right. this song we knew, we knew, we knew we needed to focus. So I think we did like five takes and that's uh, what you're hearing is us playing live in the studio and then overdub there's a little bit of acoustic guitar that got dubbed in and then i, I dubbed over the vocals too but like uh um the rest of it like guitar bass and drums that's us live playing in the studio so. well i've listened to all your music that you sent me and it's good stuff so why don't we all take a listen to days gone sour by brian dudley we'll be right back with you
And that was Days Gone Sour. That's a great song. Do you have anything else to add about that song? Uh, while we were listening to it, I remember the name of the band was the Acacia Strain, that the, the studio owner, that was the name of his band. So I, okay. I, you know, if, if anyone's listening that was a fan of that band, I'm really sorry about forgetting that. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to everybody. You're, are, you're older than 40, right? Yes. Okay, so that, that's normal every day. I forget. Okay, cool. cool. <laughs> this is why we have a notebook. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we, we still play that song. That's a little bit of an older song. It was a few projects ago, but we still play that song on our set. We still really enjoy doing that. There's uh, that part in the middle uh, where all of a sudden it stops and we go like, doo, 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 and then we start doing we jam for like a couple minutes. Uh, that's one of our favorite things to do. We, always, we stick that in our set list pretty frequently still. That's great. You know, a lot of my artists that I speak with, um, we're going on three years now with this pandemic. Were you guys playing a lot live before the pandemic? Did you play a lot of live shows? We did. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we stay fairly active. We don't play more than like maybe a show a month at the most, something like that. Um, every now and then, you know, you, you know, something comes up and you, you end up playing a couple shows in a month and stuff like that. But we, um, you know, we get together and we, we're constantly either rehearsing or writing or, uh, you know, getting ready for shows or trying to come up with new ideas. Um, you know, we have different recording projects and things like that that we're interested in. But uh, yeah, pandemic was pretty definitely like, like with everybody, we hit the, hit the brakes and, you know, that was, well, what do we do now? <laughs> right. A lot of my, my artists took that time to kind of really hunker down on recording and writing because, you know, we mm -hmm. couldn't be out playing live. Did you do any of the virtual shows online or did you guys go for that? We tried it out. Yeah, we did. Uh, we did one like acoustic thing, I think. Um, and that, that turned out OK. That was like, you know, early on in the pandemic. Um, and then uh, we 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 tried another one. Um, our, we have a, a friends in a band from Iowa City called Miss Christine. Um, and she set up a show that was like a fundraiser kind of a thing. Um, and she invited us to play and we, we tried to do that. Um, and we tried to do our new stoner rock material for it. Um, right. but there was, there was audio glitches and things like that. And we, and after that, we, you know, um, for some reason, the full band electric stuff didn't seem like it worked out on our end. So we yeah. kind of quit doing it. We felt a little bit, you know, like, uh, it didn't represent us. yeah, we felt defeated by it. Um, you know, and then later on we did, a uh, um, maximum aims had like a live stream special on because we couldn't have a full on festival. And, uh, and so we played, you know, an acoustic set for that and that went okay too. But for some reason we never mastered the whole electric thing. And so we kind of gave up. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. You know, again, we met at Junior's Motel recording studio. And then you mentioned mm -hmm. with the last song that you recorded um, with somebody else, what are some of the other studios you've worked in or do you do stuff from home at, from time to time? We mostly do it at home. Uh, kind of my day job is running a recording studio out of my house. So, uh, okay. so, so that makes it pretty easy. Um, we knew for the, the album that had Days Gone Sour on it, um, uh, Passing Through the Waves is the name of the album. Uh, we we kind of wanted some different flavor in there. And we knew there was a couple songs with jams on it. And, you know, and typically I'm like trying to play guitar and watch <laughs> levels and things like that, the recording. Um, and, and depending, you know, if they're simple songs, I can do that. But some of the material we wrote for that album was seem more complex. I was like, we need help. And, you know, and let's 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 see what, what it's like to go to a different studio. Yeah. Um, but we've, we've done things in other studios, too. Um, I, I like visiting other studios to me you know, as a studio rat. I'm you know, I'm I'm way into visiting other studios and seeing how the processes are different and how like, you know, um, you know, some of the you know, everybody uses different gear and uses different programs and, you, you know, on and on. And, and I'm, I'm fascinated by all that. So right. do you have a favorite vocal mic you used to you like to use or? Uh, the one that um, that I use in my studio a lot is the Rode NT1A, um, okay. and and that was one. It's not a very expensive mic. Um, it's not it's not cheap. It's kind of in between. We're talking about like two hundred and thirty dollars, I would say, yeah. for that that microphone. Um, but for me, when I was doing studio stuff, that was the game changer for me. Where um, I, I noticed when uh, when I started having clients come in and record through that microphone, like vocals and acoustic guitars suddenly sounded like, whoa, that sounds like professional stuff, you know? Night and day, um, yeah. Right, yeah. So that, that was a big game changer for me. Um, 
I've got another uh, Rode ribbon mic that's a little bit higher end, and I like that mic a lot too. But like that NT1A was just such a game changer for me. I bought a second one. I have, I have two of them in case one blows. <laughs> oh wow! You've got a collection. That's good. Collection, yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great. So during the day, you kind of work on other people's, all your other clients that come in the studio, and then you find time to do your stuff. Right. Yep. On the site. Well, that's awesome. I didn't really know about your studio. That's great news to know. And we'll have to yeah. share some information towards the end of it where people can contact you if they're interested. Because a lot of people okay. call us and say, we're looking for a studio. And, you know, I take down a list of people yeah. that have them. So I'd be happy to share that with people. Okay. Great. Um, Thank you. You're absolutely welcome. You have another song called Three Wizards. What was, yeah. where were you when you wrote this one? And what was the idea behind it? Uh, we decided after, um, the, the album before that, my memory's fuzzy again, but like, uh, the, the project before that afterwards, we're like, well, what should we do next? And we started talking about it and, uh, um, and all of a sudden we started talking about doing stoner rock and, yeah. you know, and at first it seemed like a, like a little bit of a joke. We kind of laughed about it. Like, wouldn't that surprise people if we actually <laughs> did it, you know? Um, but the more we talked about how it would surprise people, the more it became interesting. And then, uh, and so we started like doing some jamming and, you know, just to kind of explore a little bit. And it felt like we were pretty good at it. And so then we were sort of like, oh, well, there's something here. Maybe we could explore it. Um, Three Wizards was one of the first ones because like, you know, the, the, the template for Stoner Rock and, and at least in our view, and I'm sure many others is Black Sabbath. And like, you know, and so Three Wizards is, it, it's, you know, very, very Sabbath ripoff, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I, I don't think of any specific riffs or anything, but we're trying to sound like Black Sabbath with that song. Um, and, you know, you know, you can decide how close we got you know, and all that stuff. Right. Um, but after, you know, the music came pretty quickly and we were sort of like, you know, holy shit, that was really cool. And then when I sat down to kind of like work on some of the lyrics. Um, uh, this idea popped into my head as like, okay, well, you know, Black Sabbath wrote about wizards. And I was like, well, what's the, what can you possibly have new to say about wizards? Um, and I came up and for some reason, three wizards came into my head because uh -huh. it was, you know, we we're a power trio. So there's three of us. Um, and so then I kind of imagined us as wizards a little bit. And mm -hmm. then, uh, and then, then uh, it quickly became fictionalized. I didn't want to write about us as being wizards or anything like that. But uh, <laughs> the, like, if I felt like it had been sort of cast if it was a movie. And, uh, and so I imagined like these two wizards, like fighting each other all the time for the affections of like this female wizard. Mm -hmm. um, and, and she, and, you know, and rather than have her be like the typical damsel in distress kind of thing, she just has no idea what they're doing. She's off doing her own thing. <laughs> <laughs> so they're fighting for her affections and she's she's busy being a really good wizard you know <laughs> you have a very creative mind i'll give you that that's great <laughs> speaking of that let's go ahead and take a list of three wizards and we'll be right back with you
with three wizards, again, performed by Strong Lake Bear. So why don't you tell me what you guys have going on in the future, where we can reach mm -hmm. you on your websites and how people can find your, your stuff? Yeah, uh, we, we, we don't really have a website. We have a Facebook page that mostly tells people what's going on. Uh, I, there's not a, long, a lot of strong like bears out there, so you can probably find us pretty easily, I think. I did, a long time ago, there was a band out of like South Dakota, I think, called Strong Like Bear, but they were like industrial metal. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you go on YouTube, you can find like some industrial metal things, you know, like this band, Strong Like Bear. Um, I kind of wish they hadn't broken up because I thought it would have been really cool to like team up with them and have a show like, you know, Strong Like Bear opening for Strong Like Bear. <laughs> right, right. That would have been um, fun. Yeah, uh, but we, we tend to keep pretty busy. We're working on a... Um, there's going to be a tribute album for an Ames musician uh, who passed away a few years ago, and we're working on a song for that right now as a recording project. Uh, it's a uh, Flavor that? Basket. Uh, Flavor Basket is the is was the artist's name, um, and so like sometime I think this fall there's going to be a Flavor Basket tribute album, and so like there's a number of like Ames bands uh, recording versions of his songs. Uh, and so we're working on one of his songs. It's a song called 1995, um, and it's been. You know, like like anything we do, it seems like we start out doing something and then it immediately kind of snowballs because we're always like, I feel like we're, we always like push each other and egg each other on. Like, what if we did this? You know, and it's like, well, that sounds hard, but OK, <laughs> let's give it a try. Yeah, yeah, let's give it a try. We always, always try stuff. Um, we're also kind of working on, uh, uh, we, we talked about what we want our next album to be like. Um, and, and I started like working on some new songs and kind of like talking about, talking about with, with the others in the band. Um, and our bass player, Greg said, like, he, he sort of seemed a little sad and he said, uh, well, I, I, I like doing stoner rock. Can we do another one of those? Yeah. <laughs> well, they are fun yeah. songs. Yeah, and it really he didn't have to twist my arm too much because they were really fun to write and they're fun songs to play. So, I, right. uh, yeah. Uh, so we're going to do another Stoner Rock album first before deciding where to go after that. Um, you know, and we've got like bunches of ideas for things we were, we're interested in trying, but like, you know, um, I like the mode we're in right now. It's a fun mode, you know. Go ahead. Do you um, guys, with, oh, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you guys, um, like digitally distribute do you do hard copies through disc makers or, or what is your form of distribution on your music um the the last one we did the stoner rock album um it was uh we did do cds for that okay. um but, but we didn't make as many cds this time because it, it feels like the market's kind of dropped out of that mm -hmm. um so it's, so it's mostly digital we we i mean we put it on you know spotify and all those all the streaming services so people can hear it uh, and then we put it on Bandcamp if anyone wants to buy yeah. it basically is it, it kind of and i know that's pretty common um i would love to see physical formats come back because i think it's cool to like you know you have a physical format at the show and it's need to go home with something you know from that but I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of activity there so well, there's not a lot of activity and, and if you can afford it that's great but it's really it's one of the most expensive ways to get your music heard um mm -hmm. i i in the past have used Bandcamp, and the benefit of that i believe is you get to mm -hmm. actually upload wave files versus an mp3 right. version so people right. get the real you know quality sounding files so yeah. good on you for Bandcamp. that's yeah. great yeah big fan of Bandcamp. Uh, I mean, they're, they're super fair to artists. It feels like, um, and, and you're right. The format is that they, you know, I don't think you can, you have to do like a lossless format when you upload it, which to me is just sort of like, yeah, it's like, yeah. you can't, you can't make it, you can't put a crappy MP3 on there, which I'm, I'm all about. Let's, let's keep the bar high, you know, yep. you know, if they're going to put our music out there. Let's have it sound the best it can sound. Absolutely. Uh, there's so many platforms. Um, I currently use distro and Bandcamp. Yeah, so yeah. Yep, those are the two I'm working with. Okay, here we go. Song three, Alone at okay. Sea. Now, this is what I've been wanting to ask you from the beginning. Okay. Who did the harmonies? Was that your wife? That was my wife, yeah. I knew yeah. I heard harmonies. I'm like, somebody's yeah. adding those. Those are beautiful. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I did some of the harmonies, but the pretty ones are all her. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how you wrote that song. Uh, so after we got done doing all of the, uh, stoner rock stuff, we, we wanted to take a kind of a short break from it. And we had an idea that we were going to do a series of split singles. 
uh, with people. And so, and this is the only one we've done. We had an idea for three, uh, but then we've only done one so far. Okay. Uh, and we, and we reached out to our friends and Miss Christine, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and so we did a split with them. And so she and her band came in, into my studio and recorded um, their song for the split. Um, and then we recorded our song for it. Um, and we decided we wanted to do like a lush pop song. And, and our goal was to make it that we, 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 we had this plan of like for singles, we're going to do a 70s single and then an 80s sounding single sure. and then a 90s sounding single. Um, so this was meant to be a 70s sounding single, but it really sounds more like a 60s song to me. <laughs> so, hey, I'm glad you said that because when, so when, <laughs> when I listen to it, I'm like, you know, my dad was always played 50s and 60s when I was growing up. When I listen to this, I'm like, this sounds vaguely familiar, but it's new. So what? Yeah. where did this come from? That was why I was so curious. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's kind of our, our 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 whole mo seems to be like we're gonna do this, and then after we're done, like, well, we didn't get that, but we got something interesting. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes uh, yeah. when you start with an idea, it it turns out completely yeah. different what you originally thought it thought it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, yeah. <laughs> thought. Yeah. yeah. That was so, a that was a really fun song though. We were really proud of it uh, when we put it out. Um, our friend Sarah Goplin came over and did like a whole string section on violin for it, and nice. uh, um, I think like the bridge section of that is like you know to me that's like sort of we leveled up a little bit when we came up with that bridge. It's sort of like yeah. you know um, you know it, I feel like it you know it has like a lot of like you know it rises and then you know explodes and then it goes back to the song again and i'm sort of like you know that's that's my favorite kind of bridge and somehow we managed to come up with one so i i don't know uh but i hope people yeah that's that's one i hope people listen to a lot if you're going to listen to any of them pick that one <laughs> well right now we're going to go ahead and take a listen yeah. to it here we go with alone at sea <laughs> Your name, your name. 
That was Strong Lake Bear, and that was with Alone at Sea, uh, Brian Dudley's band again. We're talking with him this month. It's been a pleasure having you for the Artist of the Month of April. Um, Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's, it's my privilege. Any last words you'd like to add or things that I, I might not have asked? Um, I can't think of anything. I mean, I guess we're, you know, we're kind of looking ahead at playing some shows and doing some more recording and keeping on doing what we're doing. It's, it's, a uh, it's a little bit weird to me, I guess, that we've been a band since 2006 and we've seen a lot of bands kind of come and go. So like, uh, you know, there's every now and then I kind of wonder like, you know, is this cool or is this unseemly or what is it, you know, what, what, what does it all mean? Um, but we're having too much fun to really stop. So I don't think about it too much. <laughs> you and I have that in common because uh, my band hypnosis started in 2006 so oh, same okay. year we started yep All so right, we've been so on this 16 year <laughs> journey together that's correct but yeah. <laughs> yes, it's been my privilege having you today. I'll make sure to include all of your links and how people can contact you, your studio information as well, your um, the music information where they can find you. And I would hope that you would join me again in the future when you've got more stuff to release. Absolutely. Happy okay. to. Well, it's been my privilege and everybody have a great month and we will see you in May. Thank you for joining the Indie Music Room. Have a great day. You've been listening to the Indie Music Room with Heather Kelly. Be sure to listen every Saturday and Sunday right here on FortDodgeRadio.com and subscribe for all our past and upcoming shows. The Indie Music Room is a production of FortDodgeRadio.com.